Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. I started on this book in two ways. One was in 1994 when I had spent three days at Microsoft um, and interviewed Bill Gates at some length. Um, it was the first time I'd really uh, come in touch with this technocratic class. Um, and I couldn't really, exp I, 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 was, I'm, I was and still am somewhat of a gadget freak myself, so I wasn't quite clear what I was feeling uneasy about. I think what it was was the sort of, everything was presented as world transforming. More than that, it was presented as individual transforming, um, that we, we would become a new species. The thought of uh, Bill Gates came back to me when I was, uh, three, probably three, two, three years ago, when I was stuck on a phone um, on one of those call trees where you call a company and you press option one, option two, option three, option four. And, and I'd been pressing the options which I thought were right for me. And, but the options, increasing number of options were becoming increasingly weird and increasing exponentially as well. So I found myself far out on the limb of this call tree, um, unable to climb down because there was no way back. So I had to hang up and start again. And the, the striking thing about this was that I noticed what was happening to me when I was pressing these buttons was that I was being radically simplified. They, want, they didn't want to know me. They didn't know who I was, in spite of the fact that they kept putting in these little messages, your call is important to us, which is one of the most irritating lies I've ever come across. Um, so, they, they, so they keep reassuring you that you're getting there and they really love you. But what struck me was that how much I hated this process. And subsequently, I saw a survey in America which showed people hated these things second most thing, hated things in the world after uh, hidden charges. But the idea was, I thought, that I was being simplified to make myself machine readable so that I didn't have to bother with all human interactions, what a voice sounds like, what intonation, whether I'm angry. I didn't have to bother with all that. Um, and they were simplifying me into a machine. Now, this made me think of the Turing test, um, which I'm sure most of you know about, which is where... Um, Alan Turing devised this test for whether a machine is intelligent, which is where you talk to two people remotely. You couldn't see them. And one was a computer, one was a person. And if you couldn't tell the difference after five or ten minutes, then you would have to credit the machine with intelligence. But I think the interesting point about that is that it's a disembodied concept of a human. If I could see the computer and the human, I would know perfectly well which is the human. But you can't see. So it's, a dis it's another simplification. It's a disembodiment. Geron Lanier has written about this and made the point that a, p a machine needn't pass the Turing test because it becomes highly intelligent. It might pass it because we've become incredibly stupid. Now, this struck me as a very profound point. I mean, it sounds like a gag, but it isn't. It's true. If you really want to be like a machine, you can be like a machine, but you'll be less than you are now. You'll be as stupid as the machine. So this got me going partly on the subject of complexity because um, a complex system would not respond very well to a merely complicated system, which a phone tree is. Now, the point about simplicity is that it's a scientific, it's, it's, it is the center of the scientific method. Um, nothing wrong with that. Science works by breaking the world down into um, pieces that are explainable in repeatable experiments and so on. Nothing wrong with that. What's wrong with it is when it spills out into the human world, which is intrinsically complex, and I don't think is accessible to these, this scientific method, although everybody else does think that. At the heart of this was the way machines are moving towards us in new ways. There are two aspects to the book. Um, there is neuroscience, the, new machine of neuro, the primary machine of neuroscience, which is an fMRI scan, scanner. The other side is the gadget culture. Um, now, both these things are very intimate addresses to the human self. They're very interesting approaches to the human self. The brain scanner is, is telling us things, is, appears to be telling us things about thought, about the self, about consciousness. I don't think it's telling us about any of those things, to be honest, because most neuroscientists, most good neuroscientists would agree that actually 
our brain scanners are rather like Galileo's telescope. They're very primitive instruments indeed, and we don't actually know what we're looking at. Um, the gadgets thing are machines that want to own us, credit cards or GPS systems, all these things. Now, they're, they're, they're primarily because of marketing and uh, profit-driven things. They, are, they want us. They want to own us. They want to know us. They want to, um, they want to categorize us. There's one company in America that's got, I think it's 1,500 data points on 97% of the citizens of the United States, and they're pretty far gone with us as well. They'll be able to work out from one data point what kind of pet you have, for example, not by asking you what kind of pet you have, but just by doing all these other correlations. Um, these become increasingly effective the more computing power you put behind them uh, because they can sift through, say, the entire database of Facebook, uh, come up with things you'll probably do, how you'll vote, and so on, and, and define you in that way. This is all rooted um, in the information theory and cybernetics, which was developed in America in the 40s and 50s, which was the idea that information was neutral. It didn't have any content. It was just information was defined as something that had no content. It was just a message passed on. And that cybernetics, which was that there are feedback systems whereby all machines work and therefore by extension all biological systems work. This was combined with um, radical thinking about um, computer modeling. Now, you could say there are th two ways of doing science, experiment and observation. Now we say there's three ways of doing science, experiment, observation, and computer modeling. Now, computer modeling is a very, very powerful tool indeed, but it's, it's a very dangerous tool. Um, a friend of mine who I interview in the book is a, is a quant, except he's a dissident quant, which is a quantitative analyst, people who apply mathematics to financial systems. He, he was a mathematician at Cambridge working on things like fluid flow systems and a very brilliant one, and he noticed suddenly one day that the city was using these same equations, or very similar equations, to the equations he was using in fluid flow dynamics, but they were applying to the markets, which is, as soon as you think of it, you realize it's a pretty fundamental category error. Human systems will not behave like fluid flow systems under any circumstances. The crash in the city and the um, mess we're in now is a very, very clear example of believing too much in the idea that the machines can lead us out of the... Um, vagaries of the human condition. This is not um, to deny the fact that these machines are very seductive. Uh, the machines that um, we carry around with us, the idea of um, the horoscope-like findings of neuroscience and so on, they're very seductive. I'm fascinated by them. I'm not uh, being a Luddite here. I'm not, I'm not asking you to smash the machines. But I am saying it's worth noting this development, which is really only two decades old, really, where information theory, neuroscience, and all have converged on this uh, machine idea of the world. If we rush to conclusions on the basis of all this, that we should give up our lives to these machines, that we should believe everything we're told by the neuroscientists, we're actually cutting out a lot of human life. Um, we're actually cutting out a lot, what of, a lot of what we are in, in response to some very provisional information and some very provisional marketing devices. I don't think there's anything inevitable about technological development. I think it may go in completely different ways in the future. We may not be able to know much more than we already know in neuroscience. It, it may be possible that human mind cannot understand the human mind. It's, there's certainly a logical reason for thinking it can't. The rhetoric is so strong that what alarms me is that the idea that people should sort of abandon everything, should say about a work of art, oh, that shows he was, had this sort of reaction in the temporal lobe of his brain or something which it seems to me is completely absurd and, and doesn't actually mean very much. Um, which is why, come back to the beginning, I got Hockney to do this illustration because it's drawn on an iPad. And an iPad um, is a very good example of something that can kill you or make you stronger, which it did. In, in what way are we being traduced by this technology? And in what way is it not merely our tool? I think it doesn't feel like our tool very much when you know that your iPhone is stealing information from you and you better remember to turn off the location services if you're going somewhere you don't want people to know where you're going. I think it's a, it's a description of a change in the world that has not been tied together properly. People haven't seen it as a change. Rather, they've just seen it as a series of developments which they're persuaded are inevitable. Um, and I think 
part of the problem with these grand fashionable, in the, in the case of neuroscience, part of the problem with these suddenly fashionable scientists, I mean, genetics was everywhere for a decade. Yeah, it was. And very little medical information has arisen from genetics yet. And medical but our understanding of the world has been our understanding of the world advanced absolutely. a little. Absolutely. But I'm not saying these things might not achieve all their goals, but I am saying that you shouldn't necessarily... Um, regard them as definitive at the moment they come out, because sure. they're definitely not. But I think people do in the way uh, it's, it's publicised they do, and that turns us into tools of their development. Well, well that's what I was going to say, because, because you're right, of course. I mean, uh, there is a rapidity with which these sciences develop these mm. days, which was never the case before. Uh, but I still don't quite get how it is a threat to us. I well, can see how it's irritating, <laughs> um, but I can't see how it's a threat. I, I mean, legitimately, it might not be a threat. I am saying that you should consider the downside of these things. And the downside could be that um, we do indeed make ourselves more stupid in the face of the machines. But this worry about technology, I mean, I, I, we talked on the phone before, before and I, I remember something about Martin Heidegger and technology, and it was 1954, so it's just after Turing. Uh, but that was the start of the intelligentsia beginning to think about science in a way which they hadn't thought about previously and the way that it would interact. And his worry was there was a supreme danger of humans standing so decisively in subservience to technology. It's just sort of along the lines of what you're saying. And it's been, it, it's been developed further by, by uh, Slavoj Žižek. We're in the same area, which is basically that very cultivated, intelligent people with an arts background are moaning about science yeah, and what it me. might do to us. Mm, yeah. And is that all it is? Well, I mean, you can take that view, um, and you may be right to take that view, but if there isn't such an expression of critical engagement with these things, there would be no, you know, we would be subservient. I mean, somebody's got to say something about the application of these technologies. There's another point here, which is that frequently people say, wrongly in my view, that technology is neutral, it's what people do with it. Mm. Evgeny Morozov, in his book about the internet, says that this is a very, very dangerous idea, that this technology is neutral, it's just what people do with it. Technology is not neutral. It makes you do things. Um, Twitter is not neutral. I mean, you know, how could Twitter be neutral? It's all tuned to make you do things. Is there something inherent in you which resists, for example, what you would define, I guess, as a, a mystifying thing such as self-awareness and altruism. Now, we do have sort of models, good models, from evolutionary psychology and, and from <coughs> genetics, which will tell us why we are altruistic, why we have self-awareness, why we have self-consciousness. Do you think that doesn't explain enough? I, don't, I, I, I think it explains surprisingly little, to be honest. I mean, the, the, take Stephen Pinker's recent book, right? Stephen Pinker wrote this book saying violence is declining around the world. P you know, people are less uh, in danger of violent deaths. Wars are getting less damaging and so on. Now, I, I, I was puzzled by this. And I, mean, I was sitting at the dinner table with him. And I, I said, sorry, I, can you explain that to me again? And I didn't get it. And I emailed him and said, can you explain it? Because so I said, I think this leaves evolutionary psychology dead. Because by his own admission, this couldn't be a genetic development because it's, the time frame's too short. If it's derived from human culture and it's not de derived from your genes, then where does that leave evolutionary psychology? Evolution psychology? It can't predict, it can't analyze this huge phenomenon. He admits that. So I, I don't see where evolutionary psychology works anymore. If we don't have that link, how the brain produces the mind, then there's a problem with evolutionary psychology because we don't know if the mind is a completely non is, is a complete dis disconnect from that. Well, it is a, when it's a, not a disconnect. The, the argument would be that it is a manifestation of, of, uh, of an adaptive creature, that yeah. we need that self-consciousness, which is what I assume you mean when you refer in this rather sort of religious manner to the mind. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm not, it's not, the point I'm making is not that these things are wrong, it's just that they don't do as much as they claim they do. Sure. Which is, sim you know, it's simply not true to say that evolutionary psychology, I mean, the point about evolutionary psychology is it, it seems to explain everything. It seems to explain black and white. You talk a lot about the neural pathways and their incredible complexity and the right distinction, and there's a great distinction between the complicated and the complex. But nonetheless, at the heart of it, within that brain, all those neural pathways, no matter how complex, it does come down, it is reduced, it's reduction 
is on or off. It is that simple, isn't it? Um, no, it's not that simple. I mean, it obviously isn't. I mean, if you were a series of on and off switches, it wouldn't make it any different to meeting you, which it does not look like a series of on and off switches. I mean, these are not explanatory systems. They're reverse explanatory systems. They're saying, here's this system, let's go back and work it out. But you can't derive that system from the noughts and ones. You just can't. You can't. It's, it's absolutely logically impossible to derive Rod Little from that system. Uh, the, brilliant. I, I mean, I love this book. Uh, but I think here you overstate the case. <laughs> Uh, but it is crucial. Technology may have made the world, some of it, richer. Mm. But there is no evidence from history that it has made the world, any of it, better. With respect, that's bollocks, isn't it? <laughs> well, I think it's statistically true. I, th I agree there are things it has made better. I mean, I'd rather have... Infant mortality rates, dentistry, life expectancy... Dentistry. dentistry. Every single indicator no, you can have. I agree, it's overstated. The printing but, press... But I was talking in the context of the way um, when you talk to these geeks who, about yeah. technology. This is... I'll read to you. I think it's just before it came out. Yeah. History for the most enthusiastic cyber optimists is a timeline of technologies, printing, photography, telephony, rail, and air travel which leads inexorably to the smartphone and the iPad, and they will in turn lead to a freer, richer, better world. The emissions from this timeline are obvious. After Gutenberg introduced movable type into Europe in the mid-15th century, the continent entered the bloody era of the wars of religion. The great transport and communication innovations of the 19th century paved the way for the 20th, the bloodiest in human history. So I was just, sorry, you're right, it's overstated when taken out of context, but in that context, you, it, there's a balance. 